This episode of Live WP TV is sponsored by the Microsoft Nerd Center in Cambridge and HostGator.com. I imagine most people here realize that they're probably running a database under their WordPress site, and that, that database is likely to be MySQL, although in theory it doesn't have to be. And what we're going to talk about today is really what the implications of you know, the database are in terms of overall site performance and some things you can do. And there is a little bit of a sales pitch toward the end, so I apologize in advance. Uh, so just quickly, uh, my name is Mike Skubish. I'm the VP of Product Management for a company called Deep Information Sciences. We're here in town uh, within the financial district. And um, our claim to fame is we built some new database technology that is based on some machine learning techniques that allow to do some pretty cool stuff. And the idea here was that the, we are in this era of the new economy. And the new economy, you read all the bullets here, but really it's about interacting with your customers and prospective customers online and how that experience um, influences their relationship with you going forward. Uh, and the way in which you interact is, is getting more diverse, right? It's not just uh, the laptop office anymore, it's their mobile device, their iPad, their tablet, whatnot. And the experience there needs not only to be good from a sort of a presentation and a uh, kind of a look and feel point of view, but it's the responsiveness of it and be able to uh, deliver adaptability and evolve um, the experience as your business and your relationship with your customers evolves. So when we look at this new economy, you know, you can see some examples of people like, I think we all agree, are sort of new economy players. And the big thing from them is, unlike traditional businesses, A, they sort of, you know, found a new way of doing things, but I think more importantly, all of these guys have changed the way in which they interact with the consumer. And their businesses are, are evolving, right? I just saw an article recently, Airbnb is going to start doing deals with major hotel chains and using them as a source of uh, uh, beds for their uh, consumer base, right? So it's about evolving the business, about making changes uh, to allow you to be responsive. Now, what we focus on is the database and how that plays. And as I said before, uh, yes, you are using a database under the, under the hood, and by the way, it does need to be configured and managed. And oftentimes what we find is people start out and you grab a LAMP stack and you use it. And it just so happens that MySQL is the, the M in the LAMP stack, so it's there. And it generally works really well until it doesn't. And we're, what we found, we call it the Facebook problem, right? You start out, your site is relatively small, the traffic is light, the uh, uh, user interactions are perhaps limited. But as your site becomes more uh, successful, your volumes of customers and customer interactions increase, you start to uh, see some performance issues. Sometimes they're database, sometimes they're not. We'll talk about database today. Um, one of the biggest things to realize with your standard LAMP stack and your standard distribution of MySQL is it will install with a default set of configuration parameters in it, and they're horrible. For virtually every use case, they're like the opposite of what you want. And the way the system is designed, MySQL the architecture, is that you get to have the fun job, or your DBA, if you have the luxury of having one, will go in and figure out how to tune these 50-some different parameters to meet the needs of your application at any moment in time, the environment you're hosted in, maybe it's you know, cloud, maybe it's on-prem, um, Amazon, whatnot, and also um, to be able to um, meet the uh, capabilities of the hardware system that you're running, whether it's a virtual machine or a real machine. Now, the way MySQL works is they have the, these uh, things called storage engines. That's where all the heavy lifting in the database happens. The good news is your applications don't know about it and don't have to care about it. You talk SQL to the top, and under the hood, MySQL does all its magic. If any of you guys are DBAs, you're familiar with the idea of engines and plugins into the MySQL world. Uh, the reason these plugins all exist is because they, it's very difficult to have a database out of the box support a diverse set of workloads. I uh, mean, you might have some applications, what we would call read heavy, others maybe write heavy. Uh, some are doing both. And uh, different engines have sort of evolved to um, um, kind of accommodate these various workloads. The problem is, you don't know what those settings should be. You don't necessarily know what engine you should use. So what I did here is I just took a out-of-the-box MySQL uh, running on an Amazon, um, uh, I think this was on a uh, M4 2XL box, and I ran it, the column on the, the, the left there is just installing MySQL and not doing anything to it. 
which is probably what many of you have had at some point or may even still have. And you know what, for light workloads, it's going to be fine. What I did here is I ran a, um, one of the, I'll say MySQL go-to basic benchmarks. It's called SysBench. It's open source. You can pull it down and install it in seconds. It's really, really lightweight, easy to use. But basically, I ran this benchmark. On the left, I said, run it without doing any tuning to the system. And then the column on the right is saying, okay, let's actually you know, make a configuration that's useful for this machine. But you look at the difference in performance. That's a 10 times improvement in database performance if you know the right knobs to turn uh, and dials to uh, rotate in response to a particular workload that's, that's happening, right? Now, one of the challenges here is um, the workloads can change over time, and you may have a site that today has a certain set of behaviors in a certain database, and then in the future it changes. So here's the problem, right? You can configure it, but the configuration is not going to get you where you want to be ultimately. You know, as your tables get bigger, how many database people do we have here? Right. All right, so we got a couple. So databases, at a real basic level, they've got tables and they have indexes, right? And then I run transactions. I can put stuff in, I can delete stuff, I can update records, and I can run queries, which are usually poorly written and really affect performance negatively. Um, but the as your application evolves, as you add more features, as the user interaction changes, what you're going to find is the database that was once tuned for a particular workload may no longer be in tune. So it's sort of like continual, you know, wrestling match. And unfortunately, most people don't start the wrestling match until it's way beyond the point of the tweak. It's a, a, a pretty major overhaul. Uh, or sometimes you might say, I'm going to graduate to a bigger box to run my, my site on. Well, if you don't change the configuration, you'll get no benefit out of moving to a new, a new system, for example. And some of the key things that hurt you are as your data gets bigger, um, it gets slower. If you want your queries to run faster, which think about customers doing searches and things, what's the response on the present selective content? That gets longer, so you add more indexes sometimes. If, again, if you have a, a DBA that can uh, do that, that's going to improve queries at the expense of other processing. Um, disk performance usually is the thing that breaks first. You're thrashing the disk, and the performance gets it slower and slower. People throw money at it, so to speak. They'll upgrade to SSDs. They'll go and they'll throw in uh, Fusion I.O. cards, things that can really jack up the performance. The challenge is that all of these things are temporary solutions. And the reason for that is if we look at the fundamentals, and I'll talk about MySQL uh, context here, but this is really true of virtually every relational database and even NoSQL databases. As the systems get bigger and more complex, you start to see performance problems. Application workloads change or you start to have mixed profiles you might have multiple applications operating the same, the same data set. They can conflict with one another, um, and so forth and so on. But the last bullet here is the one that, that we argue is one of the most important things. The underlying computer science driving virtually every major database in the world today is based on technology that was invented in the 1970s. Literally. So you'll hear technology terms thrown around like B plus trees or LSM trees or red black trees and fractal trees. All of these are basically search algorithms. If any of you guys are CS students once upon a time, you learn the basic you know, binary sorts and bubble sorts. B plus trees are sort of the, the pinnacle of taking the tree design um, uh, to, to scale. The problem is that it fundamentally has mathematical limits to it. Uh, secondly, um, it has a lot of inflexibility built into it. So I can design a, a search engine that's really good at doing reads. I can do one that's really good at doing writes. It's virtually impossible to do one that can do both things really good at the same time. Um, also, as you start to get very, very large databases, which from today, it may be hard to fathom that you know, your WordPress site is going to have tables with millions and millions of rows or even you know, tens of millions of rows. But as you start looking at the process that we're collecting more and more data, we're trying to put more and more rich content into our customers' hands, the database grows. And from our perspective, until you address the fundamental science underneath the, the database, you start to, uh, you know, it's only a matter of time before you sort of hit the wall, sort of the limits of where that's going to take you. And that's basically what we did. We said, hey, let's try some new computer science out that allows us to break some of these limitations. And, and probably the most important thing that we bring to the table from a MySQL perspective is it's adaptive in nature. So we try and make the, the, the kind of hunt and search to find the right configuration basically go away by replacing 
that kind of manual configuration process with some uh, machine learning techniques. And the idea here is it allows us to kind of bolster the overall performance of a relational system like MySQL um, in ways that were previously thought not possible. But more importantly, we can do it in a way that requires no application changes. So if you remember back to the earlier slide, I talked about storage engines. Basically, this technology has been plugged in as another storage engine. So from an application point of view, you don't see any difference. It plugs in, it's literally, it's a 10 minute, 10 second download, it's like a 10 minute file, uh, installs cleanly, no app changes, and the net effect of that is that you get a, a big gain in a couple of key areas. First off, it's a zero admin. So those 50 plus parameters that I've talked about before, they get set automatically. It's a, it's a sort of a fly-by-wire configuration. If you install it on a little machine and move it to a big machine, it will automatically adapt and take advantage of resources. Um, it, it handles mixed workloads very well, so you can do transactions and analytics on the same platform with high performance. Um, and uh, the real cool thing is it's adaptive. So as your application evolves and new features come out, it learns how to better perform against those workloads. So it kind of keeps you ahead of the curve. So from a performance perspective, I kind of look at the life cycle of data management it comes to a couple of cycles, right? First is can you get the data in and out of the database? So this is an example. If any of you guys have had the pleasure of doing uh, MySQL uh, load data in file um, or uh, importing dump files, it can be a very lengthy process. Uh, we've done a lot to kind of streamline that. We've had some people are literally taking loads that take you know hours or in some cases multiple days down to minutes. Um, a lot of this is due to you know the ability to parallel load. Um, the top graph basically showing if you were using it from a uh, like a CSV file, pulling in a polluted file, and the bottom one is using a uh, like a restore of a, a backup file. And uh, you can see those are in minutes for these test data sets. So pretty big data sets, but you see a pretty dramatic performance improvement. The other two areas of performance that we, we think we're talking about are the uh, transactional loads, which is the upper uh, left, which is showing uh, there's another standard benchmark called II Bench. This is one that uh, Facebook actually published as one to represent sort of more of a social media type use case. You've got a lot of content coming in. You're trying to index it in multiple ways so it's searchable uh, and allow for a very high performance query runs. Uh, What's amazing is on the same machine, just by changing the underlying engine, the science of the data search, uh, you're able to pick up a performance gain of about 60 times uh, better performance without changing a line of code. And the bottom right graph here is basically uh, another standard benchmark that says how fast can you run queries. Uh, and again, this speaks to responsiveness from a customer point of view. So these are kind of some standard benchmarks which a lot of you know DBAs and folks in the, uh, the space are familiar with in terms of uh, ways of measuring uh, the raw performance of the system. Unfortunately, the downside of most benchmarks is it's not reflective of the end user experience. It's sort of a laboratory measurement of a single aspect. So the other thing I'll, I'll share with you is uh, we took a user's perspective of what the application performance changes that can be realized are. But again, I point out again, no code changes, no application changes, no schema changes to the database. It's just simply changing the engine. On, and anybody here use New Relic or familiar with New Relic? Okay. So New Relic is one of the uh, premier um, uh, tools that you can use to measure your overall site performance, but also where you're spending your time. And uh, this graph's a little bit tough to read because the scale is dynamic in terms of performance. So if you look at the graph on the left, you're seeing a, um, a, a stock MySQL deployment. And this happened to be when I think on a Drupal site. Uh, it's all I had handy for uh, my deck tonight. Uh, the, the yellow chunk in the middle is basically the database time, how much time you put in a database. The overall web response time was about 3,000 milliseconds. So this is a pretty heavy load. This is a cosmetics uh, online shopping cart type application. And their worst case transactions were, or the average transactions of the load, were about three seconds to load a page. If you look at the right hand graph, you can see that that yellow has been compressed dramatically. Again, if you look at the scales, the left-hand graph is going to scale of 4,000 milliseconds along the right zone, 2,000. So it's actually um, you know, half the scale on the right-hand graph. But uh, you can see that the, the load time, the page refresh time, dropped down to like 1,700 milliseconds. So uh, more than cut in half the performance, uh, or uh, improved the performance rather, by a factor of two without changing anything, just by tweaking the engine under the MySQL uh, platform. 
Uh, there's also the more key measure here, something called the APDEX score, which is an overall composite uh, measure of the end user experience. And you can see here we had about a fourfold increase in the APDEX score um, without doing any application tuning, just by changing the database configuration. So, uh, in any case, the point here is that you know, the, we take the database for granted um, a, a lot of times, and as the performance and popularity of a, of a site grows, as you start to push more rich content into that site, it becomes desirable to uh, uh, keep the database up ahead of the curve. And we've got some adaptive technology that uh, drops in pretty simply. Um, whether you're running on-prem in the cloud, in normal standard distros, this is another cool thing. Uh, there are alternatives out there uh, to MySQL that are MySQL compatible. Generally, they require the replacement of MySQL with their compatible thing. Um, in this case, we do not do that. So if you have an existing implementation, you can install us into your existing MySQL and get the performance benefits. Uh, works in the cloud, works on-prem. Um, we're just uh, announcing uh, in the next week or so our official Docker support, and we're going to be in the Amazon Marketplace as a standard EC2 you know, by the hour type app. Uh, I think September, we get this is the 7th, so next week. Um, from a, a product pricing point of view, if you want to play with it, it's got the best license going, it's free. Um, you know, use it all you want for development, test, whatever. Uh, we also have a community edition, which is also free uh, to use. And the idea here is that uh, you know, for smaller uh, businesses, people that are starting out, uh, we want to be able to get this cool technology out to the marketplace. And if you need to get you know, the more um, you know, uh, enterprise class uh, support, your 20 by 4 by 7 coverage and whatnot, we offer licenses that accommodate that as well. Um, but the idea here is it's, it's simple, it's fast, it returns uh, performance benefits virtually instantly, and uh, you don't have to be a database guru to use it. So uh, that's uh, all I have from a presentation point of view. I'm happy to try and take any questions um, if you have any. Can you talk about the quick and easy way to take the free version and get it on our WordPress sites and make our WordPress sites work? Low hanging fruit. Yep. So if you go to our website, uh, deep .is, uh, sorry, deepis.com, uh, you can download the developer version or the uh, community version. Uh, it's a, I think the plugin file is like six or seven meg, so it's really small to download. Uh, installs into your uh, MySQL environment. Literally, the longest part is typing in the uh, passwords and whatnot to reboot to restart the MySQL server. Um, once that's in, the uh, Data migration is a uh, alter table engine equals deep, in, as opposed to whatever they do today. And, and WordPress itself doesn't, doesn't care. It has to be on a dedicated server or a virtual server. Either. It could be running the cloud, it could be running it on a bare metal machine. Um, don't really care. But it can't be run on a share. So if it's like a multi tenanted uh, it can be. So inside of the MySQL um, uh, system, every table is assigned to a storage engine. And by default, there was a, a parameter called default storage engine. And if you don't specify otherwise, everything goes in there. And MySQL 5.5, I believe, was the first release that InnoDB was your default storage engine. You can change it, and essentially, uh, it allows you then to say, hey, these tables that belong to customer one, leave them where they are. These tables that are my test customer, uh, we'll put those in D. Uh, and you can mix and match, even within the same database, you can have some tables in one storage engine and some in the other. So it's very, very flexible in terms of how you migrate the data over. I think there's a question. Yep. Yeah, on the um, enterprise pricing, you said it sort of pays you go and scales with you. Yeah. Can you just talk about the strategy? Like, is it scaling based on what's the measurement of sure. the Sure. To... So, so the, there's two principal uh, methods to buy. One is the Amazon model, which will be online next week. So as you'd expect, it's like, you know, it's a free 30-day trial, and then it's like, I think the entry is on like on a, uh, I think it's a M2, 2XL, I think it's like, you know, 8.9 cents per hour or something like that, um, and that's just a linear, how many hours you run, um, and then as you scale up to bigger machines, the price per hour goes up. Um, if you buy a more of a, so I'll call it an enterprise type license, uh, we license it with the really two components, as a, a price per server, and depending on how big the server is, that entry is about either 500 bucks a year or up to like, I think like the high end is like 4,000 a year. And then there's a price per gigabyte of data. And that's pooled across if you have more than one server. So you don't worry about, you know, 
stranding capacity. But it's one of those two ways. And the idea here is that you can start out with a small amount of data, it grows over time, the pricing is elastic that way. If you have a big machine or a small machine, the pricing is elastic that way as well. There is no, um, uh, I'll call it handicapping of the, of the product. So if you grab our developer edition, which is free, and you grab our most expensive enterprise license, the features are identical. It's a uh, terms of use. It's not a, uh, you know, we kneecap the product because you want you have a cheap one. So it's, you know, some things feature. like staging servers and dev servers, they're free to use. Matter, right? Okay. right, free use. As with the data, replication will be in your staging with that. Right. Another question. Yeah, so um, the compression is interesting. Is this, a lot of people don't use it in MySQL because it's got a very expensive performance tax associated with it. And it, and it has to do with the way that MySQL default processes the data. The data is actually compressed in line as it's being transacted. So as a result, you have two things. You're compressing relative, relatively small blocks of data, and you're doing it in line with while you're trying to work them. So as a result, typical... The best compression you're going to see out of MySQL off the shelf, tune it all you want. It, you know, they use Zlib. You might get a 50% reduction in size. Um, with our technology, because we process the data, we do compression sort of out of band um, as part of a housekeeping background thread, um, you'll probably get about a 4x improvement in compression. So it will be four times smaller, I guess is the way to say it, uh, on disk. And without paying that performance penalty that you'll see today if you to turn compression on within a Yes. So, feedback is this part. Is it a complete drop and replacement for MySQL, or you need to be running MySQL when you add uh, the deep engine to it? Yeah, so you're, you're already having MySQL installed, and by default, when you install MySQL, it's going to install a couple of storage engines uh, federated, memory, InnoDB, MyI, SAM, right? Um, we show up as another engine in the list. So, you'll download the plugin, you, you know, and you just do like, you know, and it would do it be like a deep package minus I. Whatever, and it's going to go and install that as a plugin. MySQL, when you're back to the command line, you say show engine deep now is in the list. Is it just MySQL or do you support Maria as well? We support today, we support um, MySQL proper, if you will, yeah. um, from what various sources, community, OS distros. Uh, we also support the Pocona server, and Maria is on the to do list but not yet available. It is important, though, it is not our own distribution, so we don't. You don't run the risk of like we, you know, you know, some people say it's MySQL compatible, meaning like it's an alternative database that is, behaves like MySQL. We literally live underneath your MySQL. So from the application's perspective, it's the same thing. They don't know any different. Anyone else? I told you this is as far away from the last presenter as you can get. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no other questions. I appreciate your time today. Thank you.